Okay, we're good now. Are we good? Yes. All right, thank you, Craig. Good afternoon, um, welcome everyone. Um, I thank you for attending today's long-term care hearing. My name is Kathleen Borain and I serve as the Maryland Insurance Commissioner. This is the final public hearing on specific carrier rate increases for long-term care insurance for 2021. Today's hearing will focus on several rate increase requests now before the insurance administration in the individual long-term care market. Those rate increase requests are Life Secure Insurance Company proposing increases of 15%, Lincoln National Life Insurance Company proposing increases of 39.5%, Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company proposing increases of 0% to 201.6%, depending on the policy form, the benefit period, the inflation option, the spouse discount, cash benefit, and issue age, and United of Omaha Life Insurance Companies proposing increases of 6.7% to 1.55 to, I'm sorry, 155.4%, depending upon the policy form, the benefit period, the inflation option, spouse discount, cash benefit and issue aid. These requests in total affect about 1,400 Maryland policyholders. The goal of today's hearing is for insurance company representatives to explain their reasons for the rate increases and to explain the new benefit reduction options. We will also listen to comments from consumers and other interested parties. We are here to listen and ask questions of the carriers and consumers regarding the specific rate increase requests. So let me take a moment uh, as we get started to introduce the members of the MIA team who are here with us today. So we have Brad Boban, who is our chief actuary. David Cooney, who's the associate commissioner uh, for life and health. I, I know David is on the line, but I don't see him on camera. Uh, Adam Zimmerman, senior actuary, and Jeff G, senior actuary. And you've met Craig I, who is our Director of Communications. So as we get started, let me just go over a few housekeeping items uh, today. When it comes time for public comment, we will call first on the members of the public who are registered to speak in advance. To the extent that time and technology allow, the MIA will hear from unregistered participants who access the Zoom webinar platform. Uh, if you want to be heard and you didn't sign up to be heard, just note that in the chat function and we will bring you over. Uh, if you are someone that did sign up in advance, and I think there was only one person, and I do see Mr. Hutman here, so it looks like you've been able to join us. If there was somebody else who thought they signed up, um, then just let us know and, and we'll go ahead and bring you over. So the... Um, with the exception of the MIA staff, this hearing is not a question and answer form. So we will hear uh, comments from interested parties. We, as members of the MIA, may have some questions for you. Um, and we certainly have reviewed any of the comments that we've received in advance. We will keep the record open on this hearing until Wednesday, November 17th, for any additional written testimony that anybody cares to provide. The transcript of today's meeting, as well as all written testimonies submitted, will be posted on the MIA's website on the long-term care page. And the long-term care page can be found at the MIA website by clicking on the long-term care tab that's located under quick links section of, on the left side of our, um, our homepage. In order to assure good sound quality throughout the hearing, we ask that you please stay on mute unless you're speaking. And any time when you are speaking, if you could please restate your name and the name of your organization, that would be very helpful. And now, let's see, I think what, let's, let me turn this over to Brad and our actuarial staff, uh, who will have a few comments to make before we hear from the companies. Brad. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, hi, my name is Brad Bobin, and I, I'm the Chief Actuary at the MIA. Um, I, I would like to first just start with some high-level comments about long-term care policies in general to help clear up some questions that my office receives from the public. Um, you know, as a background, a long-term care policy in Maryland can either be issued as a guaranteed renewable policy or a non-cancelable policy. 
Both of those types of policies cannot be canceled by the carrier or non-renewed, no matter how high claims are. Um, but, but the primary difference between the two is that a non-cancelable policy cannot have its premiums increased and a guaranteed renewable policy can have its premiums increased. Um, those premium increases can't be targeted at an individual. They can't be based on a single member's claims. They, they must apply to a whole class of policyholders. You know, a class might be, you know, the, the benefit type, whether it's lifetime benefits or limited benefits or, or inflation type, whether there's an inflation rider or not. Um, but, but rate increases need to be implemented on a class of individuals. And so all of the filings under review today and at these long-term care hearings in general are of the guaranteed renewable type. And so while they cannot be canceled, the, the premiums can be adjusted when necessary. Um, and then in general, when long-term care policies are priced, re regardless of the renewability provision, they are always priced based on long-term projections of 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and, and, the, and the pattern of an appropriately priced policy is that in early years, you're going to have very low claims and premium is going to be significantly higher than the claims level. And you're gonna have very low loss ratios in early years. And in late years, the reverse is going to happen. You're going to have very high claims and very low premium and very high loss ratios in late years. And what carriers need to do is they need to balance out that projection across the whole 50, 60 year projection period and make sure that on balance, the amount of premiums collected is adequate to cover the claims. And so in the case of the long-term care policies, in general, the industry has underpriced these policies. Um, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, when these first really became popular and being sold, uh, a variety of assumptions need to be made about the future. You know, those assumptions in include lapse rates. They include morbidity. You know, how many claims per thousand members are you going to have? They include the cost of services. How much does a day of you know, service in an assisted living facility cost? Um, and you know, in general, a lot of these assumptions have turned out to be less favorable than originally assumed. And so for the industry as a whole, claims are coming in a lot higher than originally projected for these policies. And, and that's the fundamental driver of these requested increases. Um, and, and so with that being said, with today's filings, we, we've got four um, companies and the, the policies under review of, fact, of, of impact about 1400 Maryland policyholders. Um, as the commissioner outlined, there's a very wide range of increases um, from, from a, a very modest 4% up to 199%, which is almost tripling a, a member's rates. Um, and, you know, obviously that, that varies by both carrier and by policy type within carrier, and, and each carrier is going to go through the details of, of their proposals. Um, in general, these policies that we're reviewing today were sold any, anywhere from the early 90s up to, you know, the, the, the very early 2010s. Um, so, there's a, a large variety of dynamics under consideration. Some policies are in that later phase of the, the typical cycle of a long-term care policy where, where claims are now exceeding premium by, by a pretty significant margin. And some policies are still in that early phase where claims are still well below you know, premiums. But, but what really matters is the future claim development for all of these policies. So even if a policy has a low loss ratio today, if that's higher than anticipated, you know, that can snowball forward and, you know, all future years can be projected higher and a policy could, could still need a, a meaningful increase to, 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 to be able to cover claims. Um, in general, as I said, you know, some of these policies are projected to have claims in excess of premium. So, you know, uh, 125% loss ratio for the lifetime, for instance, indicates that for every dollar of premium collected, a dollar 25 of claims is being paid out. Um, and, and that's obviously not sustainable. And when companies have 
claims that exceed premium, you know, they need to reserve for those claims and that reserves come out of their surplus. And, and, and surplus is held to, you know, prevent insolvency and make sure a carrier can weather, you know, any uncertainty that comes their way and that they will have enough to cover all possible claims. And, and so as a regulator, we really need to balance, you know, the affordability of these increases with, you know, making sure that the policies in aggregate are, are priced appropriately and that the carriers have enough to cover future claims. And, and so as, as we do our review, you know, that, that is really our primary focus. Um, and, you know, it, it is a balancing act. And, you know, unfortunately some of these increases are, are, are very significant and, and we completely understand the consumer perspective that, that these are hard increases to bear. But, but we need to balance, you know, making sure the companies have enough claims to pay in the future. And, you know, we, we do not want to deal with any insolvencies. You know, that, that, that's a bad situation for the consumer and for the company and for us. And, and you know, that, that is a, a key role that we are serving as a regulator. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll turn it back to the commissioner. Sure, thanks, Brad. I thank you for those comments, and, and I can't underscore enough, um, you know, what Brad has said. And Maryland, I think any carrier will tell you, is frankly one of the most difficult states in the nation to uh, work with, and not because of the people, because people are delightful, Brad and his team are delightful, but because of the very strict um, approach that we have, particularly the long-term care rate increases. Uh, my team uh, is particularly... Uh, thoughtful and concerned about the impact of those rate increases. We ask a lot from companies in terms of uh, other options and buy down options so that consumers have lots of choices within that. But at the end of the day, um, what we have to be concerned about is, as Brad pointed out, we, we look very carefully at the affordability of these products, at the value proposition of these products, given the cost of long-term care without any long-term care insurance. But we also have to look at solvency and we have to make sure that rates are actuarially sound and that they're adequate because no one benefits when companies like Penn Treaty, our ship, go into receivership or into liquidation. And then you are capped at you know, the guarantee fund amount of $300,000 for a lifetime. That behooves no Maryland consumer. So these are very, very difficult. These are very detailed. Um, discussions that we have with each of these companies. And Maryland, um, probably more than any other state, requires and requests long-term care companies to absorb loss. And we approve some of the older policies. We are requiring companies to accept 120, 125% loss ratios, which as Brad indicated, that they are paying out $1.25 for every dollar that they collect. We hold them to very rigorous standards in any of their past uh, dividends. We hold them to very rigorous standards in looking at what their um, investment projections are. So with that, we'll go through these particular ones with these companies, but I do want people to understand how hard my team works and how much they think and how thoughtful they are in literally every line item of every filing that is made. Um, with that, let me start uh, with, uh, I think it's Jason Bushy and Nazreen Ali from Life Secure Insurance Company. Welcome and thank you for presenting today. Yes, hello everyone, good afternoon. My colleague Jason is having some unstable connection. Um, so I will go ahead and take it from here. My name is Nazreen Ali, spelled A-L-I, I am the actuarial pricing manager in Life Secure's long-term care insurance business. Thank you to the Maryland Insurance Administration for holding today's virtual hearing and for providing Life Secure an opportunity to discuss our long-term care insurance policies. I would also like to thank all the policyholders for your interest and participation. I'm here today to speak specifically about our current long-term care premium rate increase filing, which is pending with the Maryland Insurance Administration. 
This is the second filing on our first generation policy form and will impact approximately 133 Maryland policyholders. We are requesting a 15% rate increase in the state of Maryland. 15% is the maximum allowed in a year under Maryland regulation, unless an innovative landing spot option is offered. Due to administrative restrictions, we are choosing to file the 15%. Using the guidelines set by rate stability regulations, the justifiable rate increase is 52.1% calculated at the current Maryland rate level, making additional increases likely. We will continue to review our experience and assumptions to see what, if any, rate increase is justifiable in the future. Due to the delayed implementation of the fully justified rate increase, the ultimate average rate increase will be greater than 52.1% if experience and assumptions are consistent with what we have assumed in this filing. This rate increase request is necessary due to changes in our expectations of future claims. We recognize the experience for this block is limited, but we want to act early to prevent larger future rate increases. The fully credible industry study that was used to price this product has been updated again, and they show an increase in morbidity. The updated morbidity assumptions come from the same consultant that published the morbidity study that was used at pricing. The only difference is the date that the study was performed. Ideally, this consistency helps to isolate the impact of the changing environment over time and shows us that expectations have indeed gotten worse. We have no reason to think that LifeSecure's experience will vary materially from the industries. LifeSecure is offering options to help its policyholders cope with the rate increase. A policyholder may reduce their benefit amount, reduce or remove inflation, or remove any other rider. Finally, if a policyholder purchased the lapse protection rider, they may of course exercise that benefit, meaning no future premiums, rate increased or otherwise would be due. LifeSecure is committed to working with the Maryland Insurance Administration to implement actuarially justified rate increases in a reasonable and responsible manner. We appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Brad, why don't you guys take the questions? Thanks for your testimony. Um, I have a question. When, when you say the justifiable rate increase is 52.1%, that, that's the rate increase needed to get back to your original pricing uh, target loss ratio and, and your original profit target. Is that accurate? As close as we can, because of the uh, rate stability rule, we can't get back to exactly that, but we get to a, a profit a little less than our originally priced loss uh, profit margin and a loss ratio that's a little bit higher than what we originally priced for. All right, thank you. Um, and then one thing that I like to check when I'm reviewing these filings is to compare how projections compared to the, the most recently filed projections. Um, and, and when I did this for this filing, um, you know, the last time you filed was in, in for, for increases in 2018, our agency approved a 5%, you, you were asking for a 15%. And, and when I review that filing, um, the, the, the projected loss ratio through 2020 was 8.8%. And when I look at this current filing, the historic loss ratio through 2020 is now 7.4%, which is a, a, a positive deviation from the projection. And so I understand that you've said that you know, the, the, the long-term projections are based on a, a consultant's national data set, but, but I'm wondering if and how that short-term deviation, you know, it's only three years and not too much can be read into it, but in general, you know, we see in the early years a, a, a small adverse deviation snowball into larger and larger deviation in the future. But but I just wonder if you, if you 
noticed this when you reviewed it or, or if not if you could research that for me and, and get back to me on that that's definitely something i can look into all right thank you i appreciate it and, and if you need the surf tracking number the other filing i'm looking at um me or my team can provide that to you just just reach out to me if you if you want to know where i'm pulling that number from thank you Um, I think that's all the questions I had. Jeff or Adam, did you have anything additional you wanted to ask? Uh, yes, I have a question. My question is simple. If we cannot approve total 15% rate increase, so what's your next plan? Uh, our next plan, if you cannot in, uh, approve the total of 15, um, I suppose we would take what we got. <laughs> And, um, and have to deal with it the way we did during our last request. Uh, believe we did file for 15 and we received five. Are you going um, to follow up immediately to request more or are you gonna wait for more experience to unfold? So I, you're, you were lagging a little, but I think your request was- Oh, okay, was my question is, uh, so uh, if we can, for example, we can only approve 5% again. So are you going to submit new filing next year or are you going to wait for more time to see the new experience? It is, like, it is likely that we will file for rate increases in the future based on, we are pricing based on industry expense at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Adam, did you have anything? Uh, no, I'm okay at this time, thank you. So what is, the, what is the time horizon for these policies? How long has this, this book been in place? How long have you been selling this? this in, Maryland, uh -huh. in Maryland, we started issuing in uh, 2006 and I will confirm that. I think the uh, submission says uh, it's from 2010 to 2014. I think you're right. Nationwide was 2006. And Maryland is 2014? 2000, 2000. From 2010 to 2014. 2010, okay. Correct. <clears throat> and what were your original, uh, in your original projections, what was the target loss ratio? Our target loss ratio originally was 60%. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. So thank you very much um, for your information and your answers. Uh, we will now hear from Lincoln National Life Insurance Company and we have Jessica Whalen and Kim Kristen here with us today. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Maryland Insurance Administration, for allowing us the opportunity to present our long-term care rate increase request. My name is Jessica Whalen, W-H-A-L-E-N, and I am an actuary at Trustmark Insurance Company and in good standing with the Society of Actuaries and the American Academy of Actuaries. We currently administer the closed block of standalone LTC business for Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. Lincoln National Life initially sold forms HL 2500 and HL 2950 nationwide from 1991 to 1996. Then in 1997, they stopped marketing the products and transferred administration of the business to Trustmark. Even though sales have stopped since 1997, we remain committed to providing the promised LTC benefits to our policyholders who rely on us to continue to provide benefits during their time of need. Initially, there are about 5,900 policies issued nationwide with around 550 policies issued in Maryland. Currently, there remain about 1,000 policies in force nationwide with 130 in force in Maryland. These policies were issued with rich benefits that are not available in the current marketplace. Almost half of the Enforce have lifetime benefits. 40% of the policyholders have 5% cost of living adjustment benefits and 10% of insureds have a return of premium benefit. The minimum required loss ratio is 60% since these closed blocks are pre-rate stability business. 
Our current nationwide projected lifetime loss ratio, which is adjusted to account for Maryland-based premium, is well above 60% at 86.5%. We would like to request a 39.5% rate increase phased in over three years as follows. 15% increase for year one, 15% increase for year two, and a 5.5% increase for year three. We understand that a significant increase is a challenge for insureds, so our strategy is to continue to request gradual increases and continue to monitor the experience annually to determine further action. This rate increase is needed due to initial pricing assumptions in the early 90s not being met. Lapse and mortality assumptions were too aggressive during the initial pricing of the product. To soften the impact of the rate increase to our insureds, the company will provide two alternative options. One option is reducing their policy benefits to provide flexibility of choice for insureds who wish to maintain a current level of premium. Another option is offering a contingent non-forfeiture benefit so that as a policyholder who lapses due to the rate increase remains eligible to, to receive paid up benefit. The paid up insurance will equal to the total amount of premium the consumer paid. To assist consumers with the rate increase and the various options, we invite the policyholders to call our toll free customer service to further discuss their personalized options that will allow the current policy to meet coverage and their financial needs. In closing, I would like to reiterate that the lifetime loss ratio required for these closed box of business is 60%, and we are currently projecting 86.5% lifetime loss ratio. The requested rate increase is primarily designed to mitigate the emerging losses. Approving actuarial justified rate increases will help to maintain financial stability for continued benefits and services our insureds deserve. We look forward to continued dialogue with Maryland Insurance Administration in the rate increase process. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak today on our pending rate increase. Thanks, Ms. Kristen, did you have anything to add? No, um, we will be taking questions. Sure, Brad. Hi, thanks for your testimony. Um, I, I think my main question slash comment is that you know, th this block of business is on the later end of the life cycle where, um, you know, claims are well in excess of premium on a yearly basis. And, you know, th the vast majority of premium is, is in the past, you know, from your lifetime loss ratio projections, 93% of premium is in the past and only 7% of premium is in the future. Whereas, you know, 29% of claims are in the future. And, and, and given that dynamic, you know, from a pure loss ratio perspective, your your eighty six point five can never be brought down to sixty percent. You could give a fifteen percent every year from here until but the policy completely lapses, and you're not going to be able to generate enough revenue to bring your loss ratio down to sixty percent. So, you know, I'd like to know what your plans are on when and if to stop. You know, I'll also note that. We've approved a cumulative 132% on these policies historically up to now. You know, with what you're asking for now, if we approve the full increase, that brings a cumulative increase up to 225%. Is there a point where you're you're going to be satisfied that the, the loss ratio is low enough, even though it's not your original target, and, and, and stop asking for increases? Or is that not something that's been considered? Yeah, this is Kristen Kim, last name K-I-M. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is trying to at least make um, get close to 60%. But we do realize that we're definitely not going to be close to 60%. So hence, what we're going to try to do is um, right now we have about 1,000 policies. So what we're going to try to do is try to get as much rate increases as possible within the next five years. And then that's probably at a point where we're going to have about half of the block, 500 policies. And at that point, uh, most likely that, you know, only so few states with very little cumulative rate increase will be the ones that we will be um, asking for rate increases. So, so yeah, uh, so unless things turn drastically um, different from what we're currently forecasting, 
there is definitely a time when we are willing to stop asking for rate increases. All right, thanks for that. I think that was my main question. Anything else from the OCA team? Uh, yes, um, Ms. Kim. Uh, my question is, uh, I noticed the uh, average age for this block is 84 now. So uh, my question is, how do you balance policy holders' uh, affordability for these policies? Meanwhile, uh, ensure policy holders meeting their uh, long-term care needs? So, so you know, like, I, like Jessica mentioned, these are very rich benefits policies with a lot of lifetime um, products, lifetime benefits offering a lot of good benefits. So what we um, are basically trying to do is um, make sure um, that we could provide the benefit, but then make sure that the rate increase that we are um, giving is uh, not several hundred percent in few years, but smaller amounts. And then uh, finally, there's all the other options. Um, luckily for our insurance, they are able to afford, uh, afford these products. So we don't have too many people asking for um, paid up policies or return of premium policies. So, so what we are currently um, seeing is just lapses due to that, termination due to that. Thank you. Thank you you can confirm that all of these policyholders in these policies will be given the option of a, a non forfeiture benefit that, that is paid up correct okay correct. great thank you and the non for the non forfeiture benefit as you're talking about the total paid in premium you're just talking about literally the total paid in premium or the total paid in premium with some sort of an interest factor so it's just a paid up premium so if they paid up hundred thousand, that's the benefit we will be offering. Okay. And, paid up. and with respect to some of these levers that get pulled, and, and you know we can look at this offline in more detail. But you know I'm interested in in obviously mapping what the levers are because different um, benefits have different value to individuals as they age. Correct. So having very generous inflation riders is not as important um, as you reach perhaps, you know, your late 80s as it may have been, you know, at an earlier point in time and having, you know, benefits, you know, go up by 5% every year may not be as important. And yet that's a real cost driver in terms of, you know, the premium and the reserving projection. So I think that's one of the things that we're going to want to look at really very carefully um, along with what, what is the, um, support that is provided to policyholders so that they have a, a trusted, patient, thoughtful environment where someone is able to really help them understand what those individual benefits are that they may have the option of giving up or adjusting and why would it make sense or not make sense for them to adjust one of those. I mean, I think one of the things that I find the most challenging uh, in, deal in working with consumers is that um, you get an all or nothing approach. And that's because once you get into the details of the benefit reduction and what they mean, it's hard for people to understand and grasp and figure out within their context and life circumstance. So while the benefit reduction options are extremely valuable for many people, they're only as valuable as they are understandable. And that has to be a really important component um, of you know, the, whole, the whole program. And I apologize for calling you Miss Kristen. Your name on the screen comes up, Kim Kristen. So um, my apologies. <laughs> no problem. So I will probably take that one offline in order to get sort of more of that matrix, what that looks like. But you can keep in mind that that's a, a core concern of ours. I, I just want to add um, the fact that, you know, because our block is really small, uh, any time when an insured calls requesting for uh, reduction of benefit or uh, reduced paid up, um, 
our actuarial staff actually looks at each individual cases. So we will definitely make sure that we try to come up with a reduction where it's most beneficial to the insured. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else at the MIA have any comments, questions? I just had one, uh, one question. Um, given the advanced attained age of this block, has it seen any significant impacts as a result of uh, COVID? I understand that, you know, um, it's hard to draw long-term trends from uh, 18 to 20 month uh, time horizon, but, uh, you know, I think you said the, old, the attained age is 84, around that range. So um, has there seen any impacts as a result of COVID, uh, you know, premature death um, or something along those lines that could potentially impact the block? Yeah, we were definitely tracking all sorts of uh, COVID information uh, coming from uh, claims as well as enforced block um, from our 1,000 policyholders. Last year, we had about four pass away due to COVID, and that was it. And this year, we did not see any COVID deaths or COVID terminations from enforced or claims. So there is very limited um, impact to our block. So we're, we'll continue to review it and determine if we need to adjust anything. Uh, but it does look like there was some mortality, small, small more increased in mortality. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company and United of Omaha Life Insurance Company. And uh, I believe we have Joshua Weber with us today. Mr. Weber, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner and the Maryland Insurance Administration team. As mentioned, my name is Joshua Weber, spelled W-E-B-E-R. I am a product director and actuary in Mutual of Omaha's long-term care insurance business. Today, I also have with me Mary Swanson, Vice President and Actuary for Mutual of Omaha's IWP Health Products. We greatly appreciate you providing us an opportunity to discuss the Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company, hereafter referred to as Mutual of Omaha, and the United of Omaha Life Insurance Company, hereafter referred to as United Long-Term Care Insurance Policies in today's virtual hearing. Additionally, we also like to thank the consumers who are on the phone for their interest and participation in the hearing. As a mutual company, Mutual of Omaha is owned by our policyholders. Together, we share a mutual investment in helping people protect their families, their finances, and their futures with long-term care insurance. This uniquely positions us to focus solely on the long-term needs of our customers not the short-term demands of shareholders. This includes taking steps to assure that we continue to offer the same outstanding service our customers have come to expect from us, including being able to pay future claims. We considered the decision to raise premiums very carefully and believe it is the right thing to do for our policyholders and our business. I'm here today to speak about our current long-term care premium rate increase filings, which are currently pending with the Maryland Insurance Administration. Mutual of Omaha understands premium adjustments are never welcome news, and we do not take such actions lightly. Therefore, I'd like to discuss the rationale for the pending rate increases, the various options we offer our policyholders, and the ways we help our policyholders make informed choices about their specific LTC insurance needs. At Mutual of Omaha, we've been invested in LTC insurance for 30 years, and while some companies have left the marketplace, we're not going anywhere. We're committed to this product line, we have more than 230,000 policies in force, of which about 4,000 are Maryland customers. Since 1987, Mutual of Omaha and United have paid over 1.3 billion in eligible LTC benefits. Mutual of Omaha and United are currently filing rate increases on long-term care policies issued prior to our currently marketed policy form, LTC 13, which was introduced in 2013. For Mutual of Omaha, Maryland policies, this includes policy form LTC 04I, issued between 2004 and 2015. Policy form LTC 04I7, issued between 2006 and 2009. And policy form LTC 09M, issued from 2009 to present. Additionally, for the United business, this includes policy form LTC 06UI, issued between 2006 and 2010, and policy form LTC 09U, issued between 2009 and 2013. Please note that the issued years are based on national filings and actual dates may vary by state. 
Now, at the time of pricing, Mutual of Omaha and United use our best efforts to complete a thorough professional assessment of product assumptions, and then we continue to evaluate our long-term care blocks on an ongoing basis. Actuarially based premium rate increases or policy adjustments are an important component of our ability to effectively manage these blocks for the benefit of our policyholders. The increase is being requested because actual experience on this block has been less favorable than originally anticipated. Since these policies were last priced, claims are remaining open longer and the costs of long-term care services are rising more than prior assumptions indicated. Without the current requested rate increase and under best estimate assumptions, the projected rounded lifetime loss ratios for nationwide business are 97% for LTCO4I versus a pricing loss ratio of 60%, 106% for LTCO4I7 versus a pricing loss ratio of 62%, 105% for LTCO9M versus a pricing loss ratio of 67%, 108% for LTCO6UI versus a pricing loss ratio of 61%, and 109% for LTCO9U versus a pricing loss ratio of 67%. As submitted in the October 1st, 2021 filings, we are respectfully requesting the following average rounded increases in premiums for the long-term care policies in force in Maryland. 136% for LTCO4I, ranging from 4% to 199%, impacting 99 Maryland policyholders. 112% for LTCO4I7, ranging from 8% to 188%, impacting 47 Maryland policyholders. 76% for LTCO9M, ranging from 6% to 145%, impacting 570 Maryland policyholders. 144% for LTCO6UI, ranging from 16% to 268%, impacting 173 Maryland policyholders and 92% for LTCO9U, ranging from 9% to 152% impacting 235 Maryland policyholders. These increases may vary by benefit period, inflation option, issue age, and if applicable, cash benefit and partner spouse allowance. These actuarially justified increases would bring the projected rounded lifetime loss ratios for nationwide business to 73% for LTCO4I, 80% for LTCO4I7, 77% for LTCO9M, 75% for LTCO6UI, and 77% for LTCO9U. Please note that the active life reserves or the reserves set up to fund future claims which have not yet occurred are not included in the calculations. The company is not asking to return to pricing profitability or to recoup past losses, but is willing to share in the additional claims that the initial pricing assumptions did not capture. As discussed earlier, there are approximately 1,124 policyholders in the state of Maryland who will be impacted by this rate increase. For the majority of these policyholders, this will have been the first premium increase they have received since purchasing the product. To date in Maryland, LTCO4I has had two increases, averaging a total of about 19%, and LTCO6UI has had two increases, averaging a total of about 25%. Please note that on average for LTCO6UI, our Maryland policyholders are paying about 12% less than our nationwide policyholders. We understand that Maryland Insurance Administration typically limits rate increases to a maximum of 15% per year. As with our prior rate requests, if the Insurance Administration applies such a cap to this request, we will continue to seek increases in the future for the amounts that our actuarial analysis indicates are necessary for these policies. However, never to recoup past losses. I also want to talk about some of the COVID-19 related considerations that have impacted Mutual of Omaha. Just as many of our policyholders have had to personally deal with the consequences of COVID-19, so has our organization. However, even with the changes we have made to our operations in light of COVID-19, we have been able to continue the operation of critical functions, including policy administration, and most importantly, payment of policyholder claims. We have not changed our long-term assumptions based on recent COVID-19 experience. The average attained age of the Mutual of Omaha block is younger than our competitors. Therefore, Mutual of Omaha did not experience as much reduction in claims as other carriers have been in the LTC market for a longer period. Yet we continue to track our LTC blocks to help re refine our expectations. For a product like long-term care where claims experience develops over many years, we must analyze these trends over the longer-term horizon and we believe that the current trends will normalize and that our current long-term best estimate assumptions remain valid. 
During this round of rate increases, we continue to offer our policyholders subject to a rate increase a variety of options. They can choose to pay the full amount of the rate increase and keep their current level of protection, or to offset the additional premium, a policyholder may reduce their benefit multiplier or maximum lifetime benefit, reduce their maximum daily or monthly benefit amount, increase their elimination period, or adjust their inflation protection benefit. Alternatively, for policyholders who can no longer afford or want to pay any future premiums and who do not otherwise qualify for another option to maintain their policy while ceasing to pay premiums, we are voluntarily offering a non-forfeiture option that equals a paid up policy. With this option, if the policyholder becomes claim eligible, Mutual of Omaha will reimburse eligible expenses up to the amount of premium paid, minus any claims that we previously paid. To support our policyholders during this difficult time, we have a dedicated team of specially trained customer service representatives whose responsibility is to take calls related to rate increases. We specifically point our policyholders to call the customer service reps or their personal agents in the rate increase notification letter. Our customer service reps and agents are both ready and willing to help our policyholders understand their options so they can determine the best course of action for their individual situation. For more than a century, Mutual of Omaha has been committed to listening to our customers and helping them through life's transitions by providing an array of insurance, financial, and baking products. Commissioner Mutual of Omaha and United appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and would be happy to answer any questions from you or members of your team. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Brad. Thank you. Um, these policies were issued post rate stability. So they were all initially priced to account for moderately adverse experience. Is that accurate? And, and if so, do, do you remember what level of, of um, what level assumption was used there? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. And you are correct uh, in there when they were issued. Uh, and I believe that the pad we had on those policies indicated a 10% pad uh, and were included in the statistics shared in the testimony. All right, thank you. Um, as a follow-up question to that, you know, the, 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 the actual life, projected lifetime and last ratios right now are, are significantly more than 10% worse than your original pricing projection. And, and it seems like you could have filed for increases a, a couple years ago. And, and that, you know, this is a, a large level of increases that, that for a lot of these policies, the first increase they're seeing. Um, so, so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that and on, you know, if, if you just did an assumption update recently or, or you know, why, why this wasn't filed a few years ago with a, with a lower level of rate increases. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate the question. Uh, as mentioned in our testimony, uh, the LTC 06 UI and uh, one of the LTC 04 blocks have had previously uh, rate increases granted by your administration. Uh, at that time, all the blocks were considered to come and ask for rate increases. Uh, we continue to monitor our long-term care business on an annual basis. And as soon as we see we have gone through the pad, we do start the process then to go into requesting rate increases. Um, during that period of time, there was a significant adjustment to uh, assumptions, as you suggested. Uh, and so one of the challenges as we deal with the pad is as we look annually and if it does not qualify, of course, then we require to wait at least another year. Uh, uh, but we can uh, work offline with the administration if they like in SURF to uh, quantify how that process went. But this process has started multiple years ago. Uh, to be fair, you are now seeing it. Part of, uh, part of the delay was in that over a, a year ago, we did file with the multi-state review uh, per their request. Um, so uh, we actually would have liked you to have seen this about a year prior. All right, thanks for that response. And yeah, we can talk about this more in, via SURF offline. Um, one more question I have is, you know, 
there's a very wide range of increases for each of these policies. And, and you know, you're varying the increase by a lot of different factors, benefit period, inflation option, issue age, partner spouse allowance, cash benefit. Um, I, I'll note that that seems atypical from the review that I've seen. And granted, I've only been chief actuary for less than a year. I, I don't have a massive amount of experience, but, but in general, it seems like companies are generally either giving a flat increase across all policyholders or a, a limited number, you know, focused on one of, of those factors, you know, giving various increases by benefit period or by inflation period. But it seems that you're basically doing a complete re-rate and, and redeveloping all the factors. Is that an accurate character characterization? And, and can you discuss why you've decided to touch it all like that rather than a, a more flat increase across different policyholders? Uh, absolutely. And that's a great insight, by the way. And, and we would agree with you. We, uh, this is atypical to what we would see mostly in the industry. Uh, we did want to be very equitable with our policyholders through this process. So we did do a deep dive into what are the drivers for the uh, product characteristics uh, that are really driving the higher lifetime loss ratios. Now I can uh, specific, specifically talk to the cash benefit and the partner spousal discount. Um, uh, we recently went through a re-rating on our current product. And during that process, um, new factors for those were developed uh, through their analysis of uh, what was appropriate to charge for that. Uh, so, so as we went through this uh, rate increase process, we wanted to be consistent with the analysis that was done on the new business uh, and, and the work that was done there. The other pieces, um, I think we typically would, we could see increases varying by benefit period and inflation option uh, in the industry. Um, and that's the route that we took here as well. Again, trying to be equitable to those policyholders that that benefit structure truly was driving uh, the increases in the lifetime loss ratios. All right, thank you for that. Um, I think offline and surf, I'd like to understand more how much each of these different factors are driving the increases um, and, 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 and you know, understanding you know, exactly which subscribers are getting those single digit increases and which subscribers are in that you know, high section of increases. I, I know that in surf you give some distributions, but, but it, it's not entirely clear from what's been provided exactly what the characteristics of the subscribers in those two ex extreme buckets are. And so I, I'm gonna follow up on surf with that, but, but we, we definitely like to understand better what's driving the, the range of increases being requested. Absolutely, we'd be glad to work with you on that. Thank and you. I think to that point as well, um, and again, this is a, a different conversation uh, in a more detailed fashion for another day is with that approach, how do you map that to benefit change options? You know, if you're being that sort of lasered in looking at, you know, this is the driver, then what kind of options can a person have, you know, to sort of try to, you know, cut back or prevent that premium increase. So that's something that we're going to want to look at um, very carefully as well. And by the way, Brad is an extremely experienced actuary, but he was not part of uh, a core part of our long-term care team. That's uh, Adam and Jeff are a core part of that team. So when Brad says he's new to this, what he means is he's new to being as the chief actuary, doing that deeper dive into long-term care. But I want you to rest assured that Brad is one of our most experienced actuaries overall. <laughs> Thanks for that clarification, Commissioner. <laughs> um, I, I think that's all the questions I personally have. Um, Adam or Jeff, do you have any additional questions on this set of filings? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit uh, detailed question. Uh, I, I see you use this on the 17 minimum long-term care guidelines for your mobility assumption. So my question is, how do you ensure the guidelines matching with your long-term care policy benefit usage pattern? Um, uh, 
so Jeff, the uh, it did come through a little laggy, but I think the question was, how is our verification of uh, the usage of the long-term care guidelines from 2017? How do we match that up to our experience from Mutual of Omaha? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, and there is uh, a complete uh, 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 morbidity study that's done internally uh, where we do make ADE adjustment factors uh, across that. And we can work uh, with you and, and provide you some of that documentation okay. uh, through this process. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Absolutely. Anything else from the MIA team? Okay, well, with that, thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Thank you for your time. And now we have Edward Hutman from Bay Group Insurance. Mr. Hutman, very happy to hear from you today. You're on mute. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Ed Hutman. I'm an insurance agent specializing in long-term care insurance since 1991. For 25 years, I've been a member of the Maryland Long-Term Care Insurance Roundtable, a group of independent insurance agents who meet several times a year to discuss industry issues and ways we can better serve our clients. I appreciate the effort that MIA has made in holding these hearings and informing the public of possible changes that will affect them uh, regarding their insurance policies. And to echo the statements of uh, initially of Commissioner Bahrain, I would rather have, I have clients in a dozen different states. I would rather have clients with Maryland as the regulator as contrasted with any of the other states. I think the, the the pushback that Maryland gives, uh, especially as contrasted with, with other states such as Virginia or Florida, is very significant and really represents the best interest as far as the consumer is concerned. I'm speaking today because of ongoing concerns I have regarding rate increases. My comments apply to all of the carriers providing long-term care insurance coverage in Maryland. These companies continue to knock on MIA's door, requesting MIA to help offset what in most instances have been business errors that companies have made over the years. Errors in the assumptions that they have used in establishing premiums for the coverage they have offered consumers in Maryland. Other than gross profit, there are only five elements that really affect how a premium is created. Persistency, rates of return on reserves for future claims, morbidity, mortality, and the underwriting requirements, which are established by the companies themselves. Of these five elements, by 2010, the only significant unknown was interest rates. CNA, one of the major early players in long-term care, knew in 1996 that their assumptions regarding persistency were way wide of the mark. By 2000, the whole industry knew that persistency was likely 99 plus percent. I have a real problem with the fact that each of the carriers here today have used lapse rates as a basis for increasing premiums on their policies. Morbidity, morbidity was a growing concern in the early 2000s, but was well understood by 2010. Again, the industry was wide of the mark in their assumptions. Early on, underwriting requirements were not what they should have been. Isn't this a company problem? By 2010, underwriting requirements became stricter for all of the carriers because the industry had learned from experience. The industry also knew they had to revise their assumptions regarding rates of return on invested reserves, which brings us to the reason for the, today's hearing, a review of the rate requests of Life Secure Mutual of Omaha, United of Omaha, and Lincoln National Life. 
I ask that the MIA take into consideration that the only variable that the companies could not possibly have known was that interest rates would remain so low for such an extended period of time from 2009 to the present. I know you want to create a welcoming environment so companies will continue to provide coverage in Maryland. But in providing a fair environment for the carriers, isn't the consumer also entitled to fair consideration as well? Yes, I know the consumer was put on notice that companies could increase the rates. However, the consumer certainly had a reasonable expectation, certainly by 2010, that the companies had properly evaluated their risks in establishing rates, rates that were approved by MIA. There is no easy answer, but there is a best, a fair answer. As you evaluate the rate increases requested by these carriers, I ask you to hold the companies accountable for the shortfalls in their assumptions. It is their problem, not the policyholders in Maryland. I'll be glad to meet with anyone at MIA at any time to continue this discussion. Again, I look at this from the lens of the consumer. I am the one and the, the, the thousands of agents who represent the consumer interests who have to explain the rate increases to them, they don't understand loss ratios, okay? They only know that they signed a contract 20, 25 years ago, and they expected, and they performed, they have paid their premium. What they did not expect were rate increases because the rules of the game from their perspective had changed. I think this needs to be addressed. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Well, thank you, Mr. Hutton. And, and you know, just so that you're perfectly clear, we do consider all of those things. And, and we look very carefully through that consumer lens, which is why you were able to say at the beginning of your comments, that you would rather be working in Maryland than perhaps some other states. Um, unfortunately, our lens um, has to be broader than impacts on individual consumers. Not that that's not important, it is critically important. Um, but we also cannot have more pen treaties and we cannot have ships. And what is keeps me up at night is the consumer, the, the, the Maryland policyholders who had their policy with pen treaty or Amico, or who have their, their policies with SHIP today. So every single thing that you have identified where we need to be thoughtful and care and careful, um, uh, you and I can have a debate offline about some of your numbers and your timeframes and your projections, because uh, I think we might have some disagreements there, but fundamentally the question is, who should bear the lion's share of the miss? And I think that what you've heard today, uh, as you, we talk about where we hold companies, it, it, I understand that the vocabulary may be difficult for some of your individual consumer clients, but holding companies to between, you know, depending on the year and the time frame, 85% and 125% of loss ratio is holding them accountable for the miss in a way that at the same time doesn't cause them to go out of business. And you're right, this is the difficult balancing act. So we're happy to meet with you and frankly, would love to um, you know, meet with the members of the round table to hear your thoughts um, and things that we can do to better educate, to better um, help consumers uh, understand what the options are and what some of those levers are. But I will just reinforce to you that you know, my team here, whether it's five affected policyholders or 5,000 affected policyholders, review each of these filings with great rigor along each and every one of the elements that you have identified today. And we will continue to do that. But we also always have to have that backdrop about not forcing companies, you know, essentially, and not even talk about out of the market, because Maryland is not your anyone's favorite state to file new long-term care products. But I'm not, so I'm not even talking about that. I'm really just talking about being careful not to force companies into 
insolvency because many of your colleagues have also come to me to talk to me and ask me about how do we consider her, how do we consider the solvency uh, piece of this equation. So we will continue to do our best to make that balance and we will be grateful to you and to your colleagues for holding us accountable to do that well. Thank you so much. And then I think Ms. Swanson. I am just here for Mutual of Omaha to help. Oh, I'm with sorry. Joshua. I didn't, I, I would have introduced you. I didn't realize that you were um, mm -hmm. with Mr. Weber. So, no, you're perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you. So, that brings up, I don't know if anybody else on my team um, had any comments that they wanted to make to Mr. Hudman. I think you could probably see some of my folks nodding rigorously as you were talking. Um, and hopefully you get that signal that, you know, they carry your message in their heart when they're looking through these rate increases and probably all of the actuaries on this call from these companies would um, echo that. Brad or Adam or Jeff, David, anything you'd like to add? Uh, we have a few people that are attendees. Um, so we've come to the end of folks who asked to speak. Is there anybody who's an attendee who would like to be heard today? And just type into the chat function. I don't see anything, Craig, so. No, I'm not seeing anyone. Well, with that, I think then we will bring this um, hearing to a close. As indicated, we will hold the record open um, until November 17th, Wednesday, November 17th, to receive any additional uh, written comments that anyone would like to make a transcript of this uh, proceeding and any of the um, written comments that we receive are available on our website. And with that, Again, thank everybody for their participation today and have a great day. Stay safe.